right, well, we are resuming our study of the book of Hosea tonight, and as we do so, we're picking it up at the end of chapter 11 in uh, verse 12. And as I mentioned, I believe the last time we were together in Hosea, I did mention that the chapter breaks in our English Bibles are not inspired. Uh, the chapter divisions that we are now familiar with, they came about in the, the early 1200s, brought about by a man named Stephen Langton, who was then the Archbishop of Canterbury. All that to say, he was not divinely inspired, and so therefore his chapter divisions are not divinely inspired, and there are mistakes in the ordering of chapters and verses, though the text itself, of course, is inspired. And this chapter break that we have here between chapters 11 and 12 of the book of Hosea is one of the most notorious and unfortunate uh, that there is, because verse 12 of chapter 11 clearly belongs with chapter 12, not chapter 11. So we need to finish tonight by finishing chapter 11, specifically verse 12 of chapter 11, and then if the Lord allows, we're gonna work our way, our way all the way through chapter 12 tonight. So uh, we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, so we're gonna jump right in by reading our text. God's word reads, Hosea 11, verse 12. Ephraim surrounds me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah is also unruly against God, even against the Holy One who is faithful. Ephraim feeds on wind and pursues the east wind continually. He multiplies lies and violence. Moreover, he makes a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. The Lord also has a dispute with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel and in his maturity, he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. Yet he wept and he sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us, even the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his name. Therefore, return to your God, observe kindness and justice, and wait for your God continually. A merchant in whose hands are false balances, he loves to oppress. And Ephraim said, surely I've become rich, I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they will find in me no iniquity which would be sin. But I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt. I will make you live in tents again, as in the days of the appointed festival. I have also spoken to the prophets, and I gave numerous visions, and through the prophets I gave parables. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are worthless. In Gilgal they sacrifice bulls. Yes, their altars are like the stone heaps besides the furrows of the field. Now Jacob fled to the land of Aram, and Israel worked for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. But by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel from Egypt, and by a prophet, he was kept. Ephraim has provoked to bitter anger, so his Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and bring back his reproach to him. Well, the last time we were in Hosea, a couple of uh, Sunday evenings ago, things had ended, you might recall, and on such a high note as Yahweh there delivered these, these impassioned words of promise and, and hope to Israel in Hosea 11, verse 8. Turn back there with me to Hosea 11, verse 8. This is where we left off, where he says, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. And I will not come in wrath. And then he gave these future words of hope. These words of future hope for Israel in verses 10 and 11 where he says, they will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar and his sons will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will settle them in their houses, declares the Lord. And considering where that ended, that would have been a real nice high note to end this whole prophecy on, the whole book of Hosea on, right? A, a nice fairy tale ending, the, the Hollywood ending, the Disney ending, to end right there, where the, where the groom and his bride, God and his people Israel resolve their differences, reconcile, and ride off into the sunset happily ever after. That does sound nice, right? Sounds like the way uh, we would want it scripted. It appeals to our innate desires for, for a feel-good story. But that's not how Hosea's prophecy ends. 
He didn't put down his stylus and his parchment after writing uh, Hosea 11. He didn't sign and, and, and seal the scroll here. No, we still have three more chapters of this book to go. And in these next two chapters in particular, chapters 12 and 13, the picture that Hosea paints for us is not rosy. Rather, the picture he paints for us is quite bleak, very bleak, as God has more to say about the depths of Israel's sin. Uh, more to say by way of reminder about how faithful he had been to them. Uh, more to say about how faithless they had been toward him. More words of warning, more words of judgment to this wayward people as they careened toward their fate, a fate which involved being sacked by the Assyrians, conquered by the Assyrians, taken into captivity as a disciplinary measure for many centuries to this point of outright rebellion against the Lord. So what we have in these final three chapters here, 12, 13, and 14, is one more survey of Israel's march from immediate punishment and discipline, which we're gonna see not only in tonight's text, but in next week's text, chapter 13, to ultimate restoration and blessing, which we'll get to in chapter 14. The title of this evening's message is Feeding on Wind, and the title is taken from this expression in Hosea 12, 1, where it says, Ephraim feeds on wind, which we're soon going to see describes the futility of Israel's efforts to find security and comfort and hope in any source other than Yahweh himself. Now, the Old Testament prophets are notoriously difficult to preach, and that's not to give me a get-out-of-jail-free card for any times I've fumbled it. Uh, it's just true, because they, they don't always, they didn't always detail their prophecies chronologically. Sometimes they leap far forward into the future, and sometimes they reach far back into the past. Sometimes it can feel like they're meandering with their thoughts, and they give all of us sort of like, like mental whiplash as we're trying to keep up with the direction they're going. Uh, Hosea, as it seems, since we've been studying this book since September, if you can believe that, is no exception. And our passage for tonight falls into one of those, into that category of one of those passages that can give us mental whiplash. Uh, there's just a lot going on here. Uh, sometimes it's Hosea speaking, and sometimes it's Yahweh speaking. Sometimes the target is Israel, and sometimes the target is Judah. Sometimes the context is present-day Israel, and sometime, sometimes the context is Israel's past, and there are allusions even to the future. So what I'm going to try to do this evening is give you a very rough outline of the overall movement of the text. Uh, nothing profound, nothing alliterated, just some basic guardrails to grab onto as we work through this section of scripture. So the outline I've come up with for tonight is this. In verse 12 of uh, chapter 11 through uh, verse two of chapter 12, we're gonna see an unfaithful people. And then in verse three through verse five of chapter 12, we're gonna see lessons from the past. And then in verse six through 14, the remainder of the chapter, we're gonna see the plague of pride. With that, let's get into our text. We're first gonna look at an unfaithful people, starting at chapter 11, verse 12, where he says, Ephraim, this is the Lord speaking, surrounds me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah is also unruly against God, even against the Holy One who is faithful. So here we see Ephraim and Israel and, and Judah all mentioned in one breath uh, by the prophet Hosea. And what God, speaking through Hosea, is saying here is that that all of his people, his chosen people, those whom he had set his love upon and redeemed from slavery in Egypt and brought into the promised land, all of them, from the north to the south, in every town and in every village, all over the promised land, they were unfaithful. And Yahweh here is pictured as standing in the midst of his people, and no matter which way he turns, he finds wickedness all around. He finds it in the north, in Israel, which is referred to as Ephraim here. And those people, it says, are marked by their lies and their deceit here in verse 12. Uh, their sins, it says, surrounded him, surrounded God. Now, earlier in Hosea, in Hosea 7, 2, we saw that the wicked, the wicked deeds of the people surrounded them, the people. It said the de their deeds are all around them. But here, the pervasiveness of their wickedness and specifically their deceit and their lying is, is portrayed as being so broad that it's surrounding Yahweh himself. 
He is a 360 degree panoramic view of the people's iniquity. Now, we've already seen similar accusations of, of Israel's lying elsewhere in this prophecy. Uh, Hosea 4.2, he says, there is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. In Hosea 7.1, it, it refers to them dealing falsely. In Hosea 7.3, he says, with their wickedness, they make the king glad and the princes with their lies. In Hosea 7.13, it says, I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. In Hosea 10.13, it says, you have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies. Now, verse 12 here doesn't specify which particular lies Yahweh has in mind, but as we move through this, this verse and through the next chapter, we are gonna see that the Lord does, in fact, have a specific type of lying and deceit in view. That's the, the lying and the deceit that's involved with spiritual adultery. That, that is, when a person says that they are devoted to the one true God, but they deceive and they betray and they lie by bowing down to and shacking up with various false gods. And they deceive and they betray and they lie by fawning over foreign powers, as Israel did here. Well, Yahweh not only has his sights set in the north, he goes after the southern tribes here in verse 12 as well. The southern tribes, of course, being Judah. Of Judah, it says here in verse 12, they were unruly against God, which means they were straying. They were roaming restlessly. They were, they were drifting from God, which is an apt picture of Israel's wandering off from the true God as they chased after all the false gods. It's an apt picture of Israel's putting her trust not in God for support and protection, but instead putting her trust in the, in the short and weak arm of the surrounding nations. Uh, this is an apt picture of the hearts of his people, God's people actually being far from him. To borrow from Isaiah 29, 13, these people were drawing near with their words. They were honoring him with their service, but their hearts were rem removed far from him. And note, all of this bad behavior on the part of Israel, Ephraim, Judah, is set in contrast, here in this verse, verse 12, against the unwavering faithfulness of God. These acts of lying and deceit and unruliness are being committed, look at the end of verse 12, even against the Holy One who is faithful. Now, interestingly, the Hebrew there, if, when it says Holy One, that's actually a plural form which is intensifying what's being said here. It's what grammarians call a, a plural of majesty. It's not a plural in the sense of this, being des this describing two gods, and it isn't necessarily highlighting the fact that there is plurality within the, within the Godhead. We would know that as Trinitarian believers. Rather, the, the plural here is being used to shine a spotlight on the magnitude of the particular characteristic of God that he is holy meaning that he is morally excellent and transcendent. He's in the class all by himself. He's completely unlike his people. But at the same time, he is very much with his people. As we saw back in Hosea 11.9, where he says, I am the holy one in your midst. And this God, this holy one, as we've seen all throughout the book of Hosea, and as we see all throughout the Old Testament, has always demonstrated total fidelity to his original covenant promises to Israel. I mean, how many times have I said it now in these Sunday evening services that though Israel continually showed herself to be faithless, God is and ever will be, what? Faithful. And that's a promise not just for Israel, that's a promise for us today as Christians, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as those who have been grafted into the olive tree and are being nourished by the root, that we show ourselves continually to be faithless, but he is, has been, always will be faithful. That's not me speaking, that's Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.13, by the way. So, we're done with chapter 11. We can move on to chapter 12 as we look at the next couple of verses there. Hosea 12, verse one, says Ephraim feeds on wind and pursues the east wind continually. He multiplies lies and violence. Moreover, he makes a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. The Lord also has a dispute with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. Now in the previous verse, uh, verse 12 of chapter 11, we had Yahweh speaking directly to the people through Hosea. Now in Hosea 12, we have the, the perspective shift, and this is now Hosea the prophet 
now speaking directly to the people, albeit guided by the Holy Spirit. And note the first thing he mentions here. Ephraim feeds on wind. Now, another legitimate translation of that phrase would be Ephraim herds the wind, or, or Ephraim corrals the wind, or Ephraim shepherds the wind, you could even say. The idea, though, that's been communicated here is one of abject futility. Of course, no one can catch the wind, and no one can contain the wind, and no one can feed the wind, or corral the wind, or shepherd the wind. What is being pictured here is an impossible exercise, a vain effort. Just as it was back in Hosea 8, verse 7, when it was said of Israel, for they sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. And just as it said all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon says on multiple occasions that the pursuit of the, the fleeting things of this life is vanity and is striving after wind. The people of Israel in Hosea's day were demonstrating their own folly by trying to, as, as it says here, feed on wind. And what did that look like for them practically? What does it mean that they were feeding on wind? What did that involve? Well, we've seen this described all over, really, the, the, the book of Hosea up to this point. This is yet another reference to Israel refusing to bow the knee to their king, Yahweh, and instead attempting to forge alliances and treaties and pacts with the kings of the surrounding nations, including Egypt and Assyria. That's what we see here described in the rest of verse 1, which says that Ephraim, uh, meaning Israel, pursues the east wind continually. He multiplies lies and violence. Moreover, he makes a covenant with Assyria, and oil is carried to Egypt. That reference here to the east wind and, and Israel's pursuit of the east wind is a reference to one of those dry, searing Sirocco winds that, that blow from the eastern deserts and right through this very region. And here, that term east wind is being used with reference to Assyria. And, and the mention of Ephraim pursuing the east wind continually is a reference to their foolish pursuit in Hosea's day, of aid and assistance from the very nation, Assyria, that God was preparing to use as an instrument for their judgment. See, see, Israel had already chosen a very dangerous and a futile foreign policy. They were not only biting the hand that fed them, God himself, but now they were effectively putting their own necks under the swords of their once or, or would-be invaders, the Assyrians. So the very east wind, Assyria, that they are said to be pursuing here in verse one and feeding on would be the same east wind that would soon swallow them up and wipe them out. In fact, you could look at the next chapter, Hosea 13, uh, verse 15, for another reference to this east wind. We'll cover this next week. Look at Hosea 13, 15. It says, though he flourishes among the reeds, an east wind will come. The wind of the Lord coming up from the wilderness and his fountain will become dry, and his spring will dr be dried up. It will plunder his treasury of every precious article. What they were pursuing, in other words, peace and shelter and protection under the shade of, of their Assyrian invaders was ultimately going to catch up with them and collapse upon them. But it wasn't just Assyria, you note, that they were trying to sidle up to. They also were trying to, to gain the favor of Egypt. Look at the end of verse 1. And oil is carried to Egypt. And in those days, oil, specifically olive oil, was often used in, in covenant-making ceremonies. It was given as a token of allegiance, oil was, to the other party that you were seeking to make a, a treaty with. And that was quite the slap in the face to Yahweh, to, to openly seek protection from, from mere human rulers rather than from the all-powerful God who had been there all along. And not only, not only was it a slap in the face of Yahweh, it was a dangerous method of diplomacy to seek protection all at one time from, from multiple surrounding nations, playing these surrounding nations off of each other, claiming you're loyal to one nation when in fact you're undermining that loyalty by sidling up to another nation. But that was Israel's way. And that is why Yahweh rightly compared them to a prostitute who had not only one lover and one partner and one customer, but many, which comes out in all the passages we've studied up to this point. You know, Hosea 7, 8 says, Ephraim mixes himself with the nations, plural, more than one, partner. Or Hosea 8, 8, they are now among the nations. Or, Ephra or Hosea 8, 9, Ephraim has hired lovers. They're all plural statements about the, uh, the number of nations they went after. 
And then note this repeated charge here in verse one about the people's lies and violence. It says, he multiplies lies and violence. Now, that's not some broad indictment of, of fibbing or telling tall tales or, or just lying generally. This instead is uh, not, a, it's not a broad indictment of mere violence either. Hosea is not here calling out all forms of lawlessness in this particular passage, verse one. Rather, his target is much more specific. He's calling out, once again, the dangerous and deceptive and sometimes bloody game of international politics. He's calling out the practice of accommodating all these foreign nations and allying with these surrounding nations and begging for the approval and the support of all these other nations rather than seeking and honoring the Lord. In doing so, Israel was multiplying its lies and its violence. But it wasn't only the tribes of the north who were in Yahweh's crosshairs here. It's not only Israel who transgressed the covenant with, uh, made with God back on the, the peninsula at Sinai, it was Judah and the southern tribes as well. Look at verse two. It says, the Lord also has a dispute with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. So with that language, the Lord has a dispute with Judah. We're, we're back in the courtroom, back in a courtroom setting. He's back to using legal language. It's reminiscent of that lawsuit-like language we saw many months ago back in Hosea 4, verse one, where he says, the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. And just as he had a case against Israel in the north, Yahweh also had a case against Judah in the south. Sin had infected all parts of the promised land, every corner of the promised land. It had, had spread from the north to the south. Sin has never needed a passport to cross borders, and it certainly didn't then. And then, no sooner than the fact that he's gone from the north to the south, from Israel to Judah, Yahweh now broadens his charge to be against Jacob. You see that there in verse two. He will punish Jacob according to his ways. And, and that's a reference to all of Israel, to each tribe, in both the north and the south. And, and of Jacob, it says here in verse two, he will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. And those words, ways and deeds, are, are easy enough to understand terms for us. They refer to behavior, whether good or bad. And it's Israel's behavior, of course, that's in view here. And the ways and the deeds that are being referred to here are those evil practices which have been repeatedly called out and condemned throughout this book. Hosea 4.9, for instance, he says, I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. Or Hosea 9.15, he says, because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. The, the details of the punishment that Jacob was going to receive and, and the retributive justice that Israel was gonna face are fleshed out later here in verse 12, or chapter 12, as we're about to see. All right, so in these first few verses, Hosea 11.12 through 12.2, we have seen an unfaithful people. As we turn now to the next three verses, verses three through five, we're gonna see more light shed on what's happening here as, as Hosea delves more into the history of this people. And that's our, our second heading for this evening's message, lessons from the past. Let's start in verses three and four where he says, in the womb, he took his brother by the heel and in, in his maturity, he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. As we just saw in verses one and two, Hosea went from addressing Ephraim, meaning the northern tribes, to Judah, meaning the southern tribes, to Jacob, meaning all of Israel, and he did so intentionally. As here in the next couple of verses, three and four, he's going to link the Israel of his present day with its patriarch, Jacob. You know, two times in, in our passage for this evening, we've already seen Hosea call out the people's deceit and their lies. And now as he brings in the person of Jacob, the, the patriarch, it's as though he's saying to the people now, and where do you think you got that from? It's from Jacob. He begins here in verse three with this statement about Jacob. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel. That, of course, goes back to the account of, of Genesis 25, uh, 
uh, verses 19 through 26, where Jacob there is noted to have grasped his, his uh, twin brother's heel before they exited their mother Rebekah's womb. And here's how the pertinent portion of that, that section of Genesis 25 goes. This is verses 24 through 26. It says, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. And that name he was given, Jacob, means heel grabber. So going back to Hosea 12 now, verse 3, Hosea is highlighting this account when he says, he took his brother by the heel. And we have a bit of Hebrew wordplay happening here because that verb took here in verse 3 actually describes the process of, of supplanting as though you're a person of inferior rank. You're, you're lower on the ladder and, and you're trying to leapfrog or leap ahead or supplant the person who's ahead of you. Well, that describes exactly what Jacob did when he and his brother Esau were born as he grabbed his brother's heel. But it also describes what Jacob would go on to do as he sought to supplant him in the family rank. Remember, Jacob, uh, despite trying to grab his twin brother by the heel, taking Esau there in the womb, Esau was still the firstborn. And, and Israel at this time had this system of primogeniture, meaning, meaning the firstborn son had various privileges called his birthright as the firstborn son. And being the heel grabber and the supplanter that he was, Jacob tried to change that later on in life. First, he bribed his brother Esau, trying to give him to give away his birthright. We see that in, in Genesis 25 as well, all for a bowl of red stew. And later, Jacob, as we know, tricked his own father, Isaac, into giving him a blessing that was designed for Esau by pretending to be Esau, who was the actual firstborn. We see that in Genesis 27. Well, Esau had words for Jacob. Once Jacob was found out for being the, the heel grabber and the supplanter he was, uh, Esau said this of Jacob in, in Genesis 27, 36. He said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. So Jacob was a deceptive heel grabber. He was a lying supplanter. And back to Hosea here, Yahweh, through Hosea, is accusing the people of Israel, whom he calls Jacob, of having these same deceptive and supplanting tendencies as they go after these other gods, as they forge these flimsy alliances with the surrounding nations. They, they were displaying corporately and nationally the same type of deception and lying that their ancestor Jacob had displayed. They bore a, a striking family resemblance to their ancestor. But the story didn't end there with Jacob, did it? Didn't end with the heel grabbing, didn't end with the, 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 the stew, it didn't end with the, the hairy arms that he put before his, his father. No, as, we, as Hosea points out here in, in a, later in verse three, he matured. It says, and in his maturity, he contended with God. And then into verse four, it says, yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel and there he spoke with us. See, Jacob eventually had a, a turning point in his life. First, he had a dream, which we see in Genesis 28, where he was told that his descendants would be like the dust of the earth. And after he had that dream, he, he said aloud, surely the Lord has been in this place, and he named that place Bethel, meaning house of God. Uh, later, Jacob contended, as it says here in Hosea, with the, the angel of the Lord, and Jacob prevailed. Genesis 32, 28, this is the Lord saying to, to, to Jacob, or the angel saying to Jacob, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And then, third, at Bethel, the site of his dream all those years before, God appeared to, to Jacob again, changed his name formally to Israel, which means, by the way, strives with God, that's the meaning of the word Israel, blessed him and renewed his covenant promise to Israel. So Jacob was a heel grabber at birth. He was a supplanter by nature, but then he contended with God. He grew and matured in his faith and he was blessed by God. And that's where the comparison between Jacob, the patriarch, and the people of Israel in Hosea's day ends. 
See, the Israel of Hosea's day had inherited all of Jacob's worst traits, his lying, his deception, his heel grabbing, his supplanting, without inheriting any of his good qualities. They were a nation at this point made up of liars and deceivers, just as Jacob was a deceiving, lying heel grabber. But they weren't earnestly contending with God as, as Jacob did. Instead, they were going only after their other lovers, other nations, other gods. So Yahweh here has called out the futility of Israel's ways. He's called out the history of its treachery. He, he showcased how Israel has adopted none of the good traits in Jacob that he would later develop, but only the bad ones. And in verse five, God declares who it was that Israel had committed their transgressions against. It wasn't some weak, toothless, localized deity. No, they had sinned against the God and the ruler of all. Look at verse five. Even the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his name. The God of hosts, the one who rules over nations and armies, the, the one who rules over uh, the, the heavenly hosts, the stars, the cosmos, the one who rules over the angelic realm, the one who rules over all, the one who is Yahweh, I am. That's who these people had been sinning against. All right, we have seen an unfaithful people in Hosea eleven twelve 12 up through 12, 2. Uh, we've seen lessons from the past in verses three through five. In our remaining verses for this evening, uh, six through 14, we're now gonna see the plague of pride, the plague of pride. And as we chip away at these remaining verses here uh, this evening, I want you to note the pride that's underlying Israel's actions here and the, and the various forms that their pride took, starting in verse six. He says, therefore, return to your God. Observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually. As we've just worked through, uh, the, the present day realities of the sins of Israel in Hosea's day the parallels between Israel's behavior and that of their heel-grabbing, supplanting ancestor, Jacob, set up this call to repentance here in verse six, where he says, return to your God. Observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually. And by the way, Yahweh here wasn't demanding something new of his people at this point. Here he's calling on them to do what he's been calling on them always to do, what he had always called on them to do, which was to return to him, to not be marked by lying, to not be marked by deceit, but instead to be marked by kindness and justice as they waited for their God continually. We see similar language to this in places like Micah 6, verse 8, where it says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Or Psalm 37, verse nine says, those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. See, God, Yahweh, had always demonstrated these traits to Israel. Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Loving kindness and truth go before you. How blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. Oh Lord, they walk in the, the light of your countenance. That's how Yahweh revealed himself to Israel but they hadn't reciprocated. They hadn't returned the favor. Hosea 4.1, which we saw many months ago, says there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. And so Israel here in, in verse six is being called to return to your God. And that word return, shub in Hebrew means repent. They're being called to, to repent of their sinful and adulterous ways, to reverse course, to turn from their idols, to turn from their false worship, to turn from their fledgling, fledgling alliances with these foreign nations and to turn to God. But they refused. It wasn't happening. Not because Yahweh hadn't been clear, not because they were somehow in the right or just misunderstood, but instead because of their own hard-heartedness and their own stubbornness and their own pride and their own wickedness so sick were they with their sin and so enveloped were they with their pride that they resisted even these final calls to repentance but before exile. Look at the next two verses. This is their response now, or his response as he summarizes where their hearts are. Look at verse seven. A merchant 
in whose hands are false balances. He loves to oppress. And Ephraim said, surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they will find me no iniquity, which would be sin. So Israel here is first pictured as, as a merchant in whose hands, it says, are false balances, who loves to oppress. The people whom Hosea had been called to prophesy had been overtaken by economic dishonesty. And the Old Testament had, had repeated warnings about using this very thing, false balances, false scales, uh, to give the buyer less than what they bargained for and to give the seller more money than they actually earned. Leviticus 19.36 says, you shall have just balances, just weights. Proverbs 11 verse one says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Proverbs 20.23 20, says, differing weights are an abomination to the Lord and a false scale is not good. Well, back to verse seven of our chapter 12 here, Hosea's not recounting just some, some random story of, of a merchant here. He's not engaging in sanctified storytelling here. He's rather referring to Ephraim as he's calling out their abominable practices of, of extortion, a practice that they apparently loved. Into verse seven, it says, he loves to oppress. Well, we see this reality of of Israel's greed and extortion, Ephraim's greed and extortion further developed and indicted in verse eight. And Ephraim said, surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. That could fairly be translated, look how wealthy I've become. Look how rich I've become. The, the picture here is of this sin-blinded people arrogantly boasting in, in whatever they had stockpiled through their extortion and their sin. Uh, this is, again, Reminding us of Jacob in his, in his earlier days, especially in his days of supplanting and, and grabbing and lying, deceiving. Israel of Hosea's day was following suit. They were a bunch of sinful ladder climbers and supplanters uh, doing whatever they could do to make a buck or a shekel. And, and even in doing so, if they transgressed God's law, they didn't care, even if it brought the reproach of their maker. Well, the arrogance continues at the end of verse eight, where it says, in all my labors, they will find in me no iniquity, which would be sin. This is Ephraim being personified and quoted here. And the phrasing here is a bit awkward, both in Hebrew and in English, but the general idea is this. Is this. The people of Hosea's day were so calloused by their sin and so self-deceived that they actually thought they were gonna get away with it. They actually thought they, that they would never be found out. You know, it's the common thread of any criminal enterprise, hubris. The, the, the idea that you're never gonna get caught. You're gonna be the one that never gets caught, uh, never found out, never have to face the consequences for the crimes you've committed. Well, Israel was delusional. They weren't going to escape without guilt because the God that they had turned their back on had still seen everything they had done and they knew, he knew everything they were thinking and planning and he was going to judge them accordingly. Now one final note here in verses seven and eight, and I think it is worth noting, there again is some wordplay happening here in, in the Hebrew language as Yahweh here likens Israel or Ephraim to a merchant. And the word for merchant in Hebrew is Canaan. Canaan. It's the same word for Canaan as in the Canaanites, the, the very pagan people of the land that God had called on Israel to conquer and completely drive out. So what Yahweh is doing here by referring to Ephraim as a merchant is he's linking them to Canaan. It's a way of effectively saying to the Israelites, you're no better than Canaanites. You are as unethical as the pagan peoples who I had called you all those years ago to conquer and destroy. It's quite the indictment. Well, having just insulted them, Rightly, by calling them Canaanites there in verse eight, uh, Yahweh puts his people back in their place in verse nine, where he says, but I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt. And those words would have been reminiscent uh, to the people who received this uh, of, of what God said many years before back on the plain of Sinai in Exodus 20, verse two, when he said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. In other words, it was by his mighty hand that they became a people. And it was by his mighty hand that he brought them out of Egypt. 
And the effect of these words, having just been called Canaanites, would be to, to set those two things in contrast, those two truths in contrast, to be reminded that God was the one that took you out of, the, out of Egypt into the promised land, but now you're living like a bunch of greedy Canaanites. Did he really rescue you? Did he really rescue them for that? Surely not. And surely a day was coming where Yahweh was going to strip away their comforts and expose their pride and, and humble them, which is exactly what we see in the rest of verse nine, where he says, I will make you live in tents again, as in the days of the appointed festival. Now, as we've seen over the past many months in our study of this book, Hosea in his prophecy generally offered a, a positive, uh, if not nostalgic view of the wilderness in his prophecy. Since in the wilderness, that was really a picture most of the time of, of the honeymoon phase between God and Israel. Uh, Hosea 2.15 says, she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt, there being the wilderness. Uh, Hosea 9.10, he says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in its first season. These are positive descriptions. Not here. Uh, not in verse 9. What's being described here in chapter 12 at the end of verse 9 is Israel's upcoming period of exile. A period in which they would be leaving behind what they thought was their self-attained wealth. They were about to be completely humbled by God in their upcoming season of exile. This was going to be a season that they faced that was going to be marked by inconvenience and a, and a total feeling of being unsettled and, and worries and anxieties associated with living in a land that was not their own. Uh, they were going to be forcibly put in a position of humble dependence. And like their ancestors, they were about to become homeless wanderers, living, it says, in tents again, as in the days of the appointed festival. That's a reference to the, the Feast of Tabernacles, that, that week-long feast in which Israel was supposed to remember the days of the wilderness wander wanderings by living in booths. So now they're about to go back outdoors, back in tents, to learn of their need for total trust and dependence on Yahweh, a lesson they should have learned many centuries before. Well, he continues on in verse 10. Now we're in the first person, Yahweh speaking directly here, where he says, I have also spoken to the prophets, and I've given numerous visions, and through the prophets I gave parables. Now, this morning in our study of James, we saw how the prophets of old were examples of, of patient endurance, here in Hosea, the prophets are being brought up to communicate to the people of Israel in this time, in effect, something like this. It's not like I didn't warn you. Yahweh here is saying to his people, I gave you every opportunity to turn back to me. I sent you my prophets, but you ignored them. God had done more than his part. He, he, he spoke to his prophets, as it says here, through these numerous visions. And we have references to those visions, by the way, in, in the scriptures. Um, Isaiah 1.1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Obadiah 1, the vision of Obadiah. Nahum 1, 1, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. See, God revealed his plans and his purposes through these visions he gave those prophets. But he also communicated, obviously, as we know from holding a prophetic work here, through the written word to communicate to his people. And one of the ways he did that was through parables. It says, and through the prophets, I gave parables. Verse 10 there. Parables meaning a divine form of, of revelation which both reveals and conceals. Uh, perhaps by way of analogy, perhaps by way of comparison, we do have examples of those in the Old Testament. But bringing it back to verse 10 here, the main idea that God is communicating to his people through Hosea here is I tried. I, I tried to get through to you by various means, through the prophets, through the visions I gave those prophets, through the parables I gave you, but you wouldn't listen. You rejected me, and you still reject me. It calls to mind a passage we saw last time in Hosea 11.2, speaking of the prophets. It says, the more they called them, meaning the more the prophets called the people, the more they, the people, went from them. Well, he goes on to move on with his indictment of Israel in verse 11 as he brings up Gilead and Gilgal. Verse 11, he says, is there iniquity in Gilead? 
Surely they are worthless. In Gilgal, they sacrifice bulls. Yes, their altars are like stone heaps beside the furrows of the field. Now you'll note, it's phrased there as a question. Is there iniquity in Gilead? That can actually be translated more certainly as a propositional statement. You could actually translate that, surely there is iniquity in Gilead, or since there is iniquity in Gilead. And that makes sense because there actually was iniquity in Gilead. You might remember many weeks ago now, we saw in Hosea 6, verse 8, the city of Gilead being called out for its sin. You might remember that there we saw Gilead sort of linked together with two other cities, Adam and Shechem, sort of the the tri-city area of sin. And Adam, it said in Hosea 6, 7, has transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacherously, treacherously with me. Uh, Of Shechem in verse 9, chapter 6, it says, surely they have committed a crime. And of Gilead, Hosea 6, 8, it's called a city of wrongdoers, tracked with bloody footprints. In other words, Gilead lived up to the name here they're given in uh, chapter 12, verse 11, where they're called worthless. And there's Gilgal, the other city mentioned here. They're no better. Uh, Gilgal was located between Jordan and Jericho in in the area of Samaria. And it was once a holy place to God. It was actually established as a memorial location by Joshua after he led the people into the promised land. However, by Hosea's day, it had become completely desecrated by idol worship that took place there. As it says here in verse 11, in Gilgal, they sacrifice bulls. Well, the party was over, and the wicked practices were coming to an end. And in the incoming invasion of the Assyrians, the altars and shrines there at Gilgal that had been dedicated to false worship were soon going to be torn down. That's what it says at the end of verse 11 here. They would become like stone heaps beside the furrows of the field. Uh, Their once precious altars would soon be broken down into these shapeless piles of rubble. And that brings us to our final few verses for this evening. And in these last few verses, we have both historical flashbacks, but also present day insights into the Israel of Hosea's day. We'll start with the flashbacks in verses 12 and 13. It says, now Jacob fled to the land of Aram and Israel worked for a wife and for a wife, he kept sheep. But by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel from Egypt and by a prophet, he was kept. So we're back to the Jacob story here. And what's brought to remembrance specifically here in verse 12, similar to what we saw back in verses three and four, are are the good and the bad that were shown in Jacob, the patriarch's life. The, The two are set in contrast against each other. The good, or I'm sorry, the bad, was that he fled to the land of Aram, as it says here in verse 12. And and he fled to the land of Aram after he stole his brother Esau's uh, birthright and blessing. The good, though, is that as Israel now, with this new name, Israel, he worked for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. That's, of course, referring to his many years of serving, serving Laban so that he can marry Laban's daughter, Rachel. There's good and there's bad there in verse 12. Fast forward to Hosea's day, though. And none of the good, again, of their ancestor, Jacob, was being shown by Israel during this time. Rather than working hard, as Jacob did for his wife, Rachel, uh, the Israel of Hosea's day was conniving and thieving and cheating. We saw that a few verses ago with their false scales. They were functional Canaanites. And then the historical flashback continues in verse 13 where it says, but by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel from Egypt, and by a prophet, he was kept. And that's a reference to Moses, a mouthpiece for God, who brought Israel out of Egypt and and tended to them during their their period of that wilderness wandering. And this this verse, verse 13, has caused people confusion. Uh, It doesn't mention Moses by name, but but the, the, the context surely references Moses. And they wonder, why is it that Moses is being brought up here? I think there are at least a couple of good reasons or good explanations for why Moses is mentioned here, if not by name. A first is to highlight the length of time between Moses and Hosea, a period of some 700 or so years that Israel had continually been hearing the word of God through a man, a prophetic word through human instruments. 
Moses all the way down to, to Hosea, and yet the message still wasn't sinking in. That's one idea. Uh, second is to remind Israel of the fact that as in the days of Moses, they were about to go back into the wilderness. They were about to, to wander again nomadically just as they had done during the days of Moses. It was all going to happen again. History was about to repeat itself. And that, importantly, that though they, they grumbled all, all the way through it in the, in the days of Moses, now they're going to look back on the days of Moses as the good old days, as they get ready to go into exile into Assyria. Speaking of which, verse 14, the final verse where we see this section not ending on a positive note, not at all, but rather a gloomy note. It says, Ephraim has provoked to bitter anger, so his Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and bring back his reproach to him. Uh, through its idolatry, uh, through its hard-heartedness, through its stubbornness, through its wickedness, Ephraim, uh, or Israel, had provoked Yahweh, it says, to bitter anger. And, and because is Israel, Ephraim, had shown no signs of, of repentance or, or transformation, the Lord would leave upon this nation its guilt. And those words are reminiscent of Hosea 10, verse 2, which says, their heart is faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. The Lord would not extend forgiveness. Rather, he would leave this wicked people, this wicked generation, in their guilt, and he would repay them for evil, without atonement for sin. That's what they would get, uh, which has always been the case. And the, the individual Israelites to whom Hosea is writing here would face the consequences of their sin, not only in Assyria, but individually in eternal judgment. I could close in prayer right there and we'd have a really bummed out audience as we, we leave for the evening. Um, but I'll just highlight one last thing, which is that the punishment that, that Israel was facing here seems ultimate, right? Facing the bitter anger of the Lord, knowing that their, their blood guilt had been left upon them, bearing the reproach of the Lord. But we always have to remember when we read in the Old Testament and when we're dealing with prophetic works in particular, there's always this aspect of, of immediate and near re realization and, and further realization. And, and we have to remember that Israel's exile in Assyria was only to be temporary. And that also Israel's separation from her Lord is only temporary. And that's because just as it was true in, in Hosea's day, it is true in our day that God has not forgotten his promises to Israel going all the way back to Genesis 12. Uh, those promises, going back to Genesis 12 and carrying forward, ha have not been superseded, have not been canceled out, have not been declared null and void just because we're in the church age. And, and though the, the, the blood guilt of Israel was left on them in Hosea's day to this generation of, of Israelites as they went off into captivity in Assyria, we also know that it's through the blood of their Messiah, their Savior, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, that the sins of all people, whether male or female, whether slave or free, whether Jew or Gentile, can be forgiven and washed through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Gordy read a couple of these passages already during his testimony, but we remember Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his own, own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We remember Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together in Christ. We remember Titus 3, 4, and 5. But when the kindness of our God and Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. And not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. And a day is coming when, when the future Israel, when future Israel will recognize their Messiah. It's in that context, in that sense, that all Israel will be saved. At that point, they will come to their Messiah, they'll return to their Messiah. And that, that future day has been pictured all over the book of Hosea. And we're gonna see it pictured again in a couple of weeks when we get to Hosea 14. But I just can't wait. Turn with me to Hosea 14 real quick. Let's end on a positive note as we think of the, the glorious future for Israel. Hosea 14, verse four, says, I will heal their apostasy, I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. 
His shoots will sprout and his beauty will be like the olive tree and his fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. Those who live in his shadow will again raise grain and they will blossom like the vine. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can, uh, in this day, at this time, in this church, in this part of the world, look back on an ancient book that was written to uh, Israelites uh, so many years ago and still find eternal truths that we can be encouraged by and comforted by and strengthened by. Thank you for your faithfulness in all things. Thank you for your faithfulness to Israel. Thank you for your faithfulness to the church uh, and, and, and us as the, the, uh, the grafted in ones. Thank you, thank you for your faithfulness to your word. Thank you for your faithfulness to your people. Thank you that we can walk through this world. We can go into the week that's ahead knowing that though we fail you all the time, Though we sin, though we fall short, you are an eternally faithful God, a God who keeps his promises faithfully and always will. God, I pray that going into this week, we would be spurred on and encouraged and reminded uh, not about how good we are or how great we are or how, how we think of ourselves in any sense, but that we would just rest in who you are and rest specifically in your faithfulness. Thank you for being a faithful, covenant-keeping God in whom we can trust. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.